tales from the Norse legends. The creation of the universe. In the beginning was Ginungagap, the great emptiness, the unending void. It was a region so vast that it went on in all directions forever, with room for a billion universes. There was no up nor down in Ginungagap, no light, no darkness, no north, south, east, nor west. There was no sound in Ginungagap, yet no silence either, only endless space. No one knows the secret of creation, how something could be formed out of nothing. But millions of eons before our universe existed, two distinct regions came into being, two completely different worlds, the lands of fire and ice. The land of fire was called Muspelheim, which means the home of the destroyers of the world, and it was a truly terrible place. There was nothing in Muspelheim except black, burning rocks, continually erupting volcanoes, molten lava, and a sky permanently filled with black, choking smoke. Howling winds blew clouds of flame and showers of sparks through the smoky sky. Volcanic dust covered everything, and great sheets of flame burst sporadically from the burning ground which was continuously cracking and splitting. Nothing lived in Muspelheim at first, except for one being, the dreaded Sirt, the fire demon, whose dwelling place was in its very centre. Sirt was the first being, and would spend eons forging his doomsday weapon, the great fire sword that it was his destiny to wield, come Ragnarok, the twilight of the gods, when he would burst forth out of Muspelheim to lay waste the universe. The other region... Niflheim was a very different place to Muspelheim. While equally vast and desolate, it was cold and frozen, a land of ice and snow where Muspelheim was all roaring fires and heat. The winds of Niflheim never ceased blowing, and they blew great torrents of freezing rain and hail across endless snowfields. Huge glaciers, mountains of snow and ice cracked and split the frozen earth. The rivers and seas of the universe had their origin in Niflheim, flowing out of Virgilmere, the primal river, which was also known as the Roaring Cauldron, or else they stemmed from the freezing depths of Elivagar, the primal spring that filled the seas of Niflheim, its dark, cold waters spilling out and filling up the northern parts. The waters of Niflheim, its rivers and seas, were incredibly dangerous, Mountainous icebergs, whirlpools, great frozen cliffs that opened and closed like the jaws of some massive beast. The waters of this icy wilderness were anything but pure, however, for Elivagar was polluted by numerous streams of vile black poison that flowed into its waters, corrupting them and forming black ice when it reached the surface. This taint in the fabric of Niflheim would have dire consequences in time, and it spread throughout the entire northern part of Ginungagap. As eons passed and the lands of fire and ice continued to spread across Ginungagap, they eventually came into contact with each other. When the hot fires of Muspelheim came in contact with the cold air of Niflheim, an awesome phenomenon took place. The collision of fire and ice caused a huge explosion, sending millions of tons of water flying into the air to rain down all along the breadth of Ginung Gap, where the lands of fire and ice had met. As the freezing waters of Niflheim fell, where they mixed with the ash and clay of Muspelheim, they formed the body of a giant. Now when life sprang forth in Ginung Gap, it did not happen in a matter of minutes, in fact, the giant lay prone and unconscious for many eons, unfeeling and unmoving. His name was Orglmir, although his offspring called him Ymir, 
and he was the first of the mountain giants. For eons, Ymir lay sleeping, and the various elements that he was composed of mixed and melded: the water and snow, the ice and clay, the cinder and ash, the hot smoke and the freezing air, and the poison waters of Elivagar. After a long time, his body solidified, and he began to sweat. From beneath his left armpit, a male and a female were born. And soon after, his right foot mated with his left, and he gave birth to a six-headed giant son. These first creatures were to found the races of the ice and mountain giants. Elsewhere in Ganungagap, another being had been born, following the merging of fire and ice. This being was an enormous cow called Adumla. Now Adumla was formed at the same time as Ymir. But none of the poison of Elivagar had gone into her creation, for she was formed from the pure ice and the fire of Muspelheim. Since no grass or trees existed, Adumla had nothing to eat, so she fed herself by licking the ice. And as she fed, four great streams of milk flowed from her udders, feeding the giant Ymir. Then something very strange happened. As Adumla licked away at the ice. And night began to fall at the end of the first day. She uncovered the hair of a man. Throughout the whole next day, Adumla licked and sucked away into the ice until the man's head and shoulders were uncovered. On the third day, a complete being stood uncovered, naked, and beautiful on the ice, huge and powerful and awesome to look upon. This was Buri, the father of the gods. Buri gave birth to a son called Bor, who married Bestla, the daughter of a giant called Balethorn. In time, Bor and Bestla had children, three sons, who were called Vili, Ve, and Odin. The creation of the world. Now these being mentioned so far were the primal beings of the universe, from whom all the other gods, giants, and men would descend. All of them had been formed in the nothingness of Ginungagap, between the realms of Muspelheim and Niflheim. Those which had been created within the pure ice and fire, like Bori, were good. For those whose creation had been tainted by the black corruption of Elivagar, were evil. Such is the nature of good and evil; they cannot coexist peacefully. And sooner or later, the gods and giants would clash in the roaring madness of battle. The first conflict between the giants and the gods led to the death of Ymir and the creation of the world. The sons of Ymir, the ice giants Throthjalmir and Burjalmir, were huge, misshapen, violent beings with dark intentions and cold hearts. Their continual roaring and thundering angered Odin and his brothers Vili and Ve, and so they went to speak with the ice giants and counsel them to make less noise. And be better neighbors, but the ice giants had strife in their blood, and responded to the gods' request for consideration with roaring violence, and a fight ensued which shook the heavens. In the course of the fight, the three brother gods killed the giant Emir, chopping him apart. So much blood flowed from his wounds that all his family were drowned, with the exception of the youngest, Burjalmir. Who managed to escape by swimming through the waves of blood, dragging his wife behind him by the hair, until he reached an enormous hilltop, which even the oceans of Ymir's blood could not cover. There, he and his wife collapsed, exhausted, panting like dogs, but safe from the wrath of the gods. The gods used Ymir's remains to create the world, chopping and hammering at the body. They created the earth. Forming sweeping plains where they bashed it flat, and rocky mountain ranges and the deep, dry sea beds, 
Then they squeezed the blood out of his flesh. His blood filled all the oceans, seas, and rivers. Then they took his teeth and bones and smashed them up, making the individual rocks, lofty crags, and sea cliffs. And by grinding the bone to powder, they formed the sandy beaches and deserts. They used his hair to make trees and bushes, and where the flesh, contaminated by Ilivigar's corruption, fell, the races of dwarves and trolls were created. Spontaneously appearing as maggots do in a dead and rotting fish, having created the earth, the gods found it to be a dark and gloomy place that oppressed the spirits, and so to make it more habitable, decided to create the sky, which they made from the skull of Emir, lifting it up between the three of them. To hold the sky in place, Odin ordered four of the recently born dwarves to support its four corners. The dwarves he named North, South, East, and West. Then Odin took one of the sons of Bergelmir, the giant, and turned him into an enormous eagle, and placed him where the seas ended, enchanting him, so that it would beat his wings endlessly and create the winds that blow across the earth and move the waves of the sea. Heaven and earth being created, the gods then took some of the blazing sparks that blew through the firmament above Muspelheim, and scattered them in the heavens, creating the stars. Next, the gods split the world into two distinct realms. The first of these they named Jotunheim, the land of the giants, and they surrounded it with seas and oceans and great mountainous peaks. So that the surviving giants and their descendants would have somewhere to live, but were hemmed in, making it difficult for them to get out, and cause trouble. They took the eyebrows of Emir and formed them into huge cliffs, unassailable palisades of ice and rock, creating a walled citadel in the centre of the earth, which they named Midgard, or the Middle Fortress, which was to be the home of man. Night and sun and moon. At first, the world was a dark and gloomy place, even with its great open skies, and the gods were obliged to create the sun and the moon. So that life for a man would not be so gloomy and dreary. They also had to invent day and night to make his time on earth better. By day he could work, farm, fish, and hunt, and by night sleep and recover his energy for the following day's work. Even though the gods devised a system of day and night for man's benefit, they set the giants to work in doing so. Night was a giantess, the daughter of Nafi of Jotunheim, and she was a beautiful creature with long, flowing black hair, shiny and dark as a raven's wing. Her first husband was a giant called Darkness, with whom she had a baby that they called Space. Her second husband was a mysterious character known simply as the Other, and there are many theories as to his identity. The two had a daughter called Earth, and shortly after, the other vanished, leaving Night alone. Finally, Night married a third husband named Dawn, a blond-haired figure, and together they had a fair-haired, shining son, who was called Day. The gods decided to divide each turning of the Earth, which took twenty-four hours, into two halves to be equally divided into night and day. Night and day were given a chariot each, and a pair of mighty horses, which would gallop so fast that the chariot would lift off from the ground and fly through the sky. Night and day are not alone as they ride through the skies on their endless gallop. 
The gods created the sun and the moon to keep them company. The sun and the moon were fixed in the heavens at first, unmoving, and both could be seen together, whether it was night or day. Then one day, a being descended from the giants called Mundilferi, which means the world turner, had two children, a boy and a girl, who were so beautiful he named them Sun and Moon, boasting that they outshone everything else in creation, except those two celestial bodies. The gods were annoyed by Mundil for his vanity and arrogance, and punished him, as was their wont in such cases, by taking away his children and putting them to work in the heavens. The girl's son was given the task of riding and steering the mighty steeds that pulled the chariot of the sun. So that she would not be burned to death, the gods placed an indestructible shield named Svalin, or Cold Iron, between the chariot of the sun and the horses and their rider. So she rides the mighty horses through the heavens, happy and free in her punishment, fearing only the day the spawn of Fenrir, the great black wolf of Ragnarok, will catch up with her and swallow the sun. The boy Moon rides through the heavens just like his sister, but because his task is more complicated, since the moon must wax and wane, the gods permitted him a pair of helpers, two children named Bill and Yuki, who were snatched by the moon from the peak of a mountain where they had been sent by their grandfather to fetch water from a well which was sacred to the gods. By turns, the boy Bill and his sister, Yuri, draw a dark curtain back and forth over the moon, so changing its appearance and making it difficult to find for the brother of the black wolf that hunts the sun. This other wolf is a great grey white beast, a true spawn of Ragnarok, and it runs frothing at the mouth, saliva dripping from its great yellow fangs, its red eyes gleaming in the darkness, hungry to find and swallow the moon as it one day must. Ragnarok is inevitable, and even the gods have to accept that one day it will come, for their lives too are bound by the tapestries woven by the Norns, the three weird sisters of destiny. The great fear of Ragnarok was one of the reasons Odin created men. He created men to be warriors, so that when the dreaded time arrived, there would be a huge army to help the gods against the giants and monsters. Odin created man and woman in the dawn of time when the world was still young. He was walking along the seashore with his two brothers, Vili and Ve, who were sometimes known as Hanir and Lodir, not long after they had created the world. Two tree trunks had been washed up on the beach, as the sun began to set and the three brother gods drew up close to the logs, they had an idea. Vili took handfuls of golden sand and began to fill up the hollow trunk of one of the trees, which was an ash, and they did the same with the other, an elm. Odin then bent down and breathed the spirit of life into the dead trees. The three gods then stood back and watched as first a woman and then a man took form and began to emerge from the two pieces of driftwood. The Golden Age of Asgard At the same time as Midgard and Jotunheim were created, Odin and his brothers created homes for themselves. Odin named his home Asgard, which means the home of the Aesir. The Aesir were the children of Odin and Frigg, his wife. Asgard was created apart from Midgard and Jotunheim, but was connected to them by a magical rainbow bridge called Bifrost. Vili and Ve, for their part, made their homes in Vanaheim to the east of Asgard, and their children were called the Vanir. Asgard was a truly beautiful place. The sky was always blue, and the sun always shone there. 
It was neither too hot nor too cold, but always pleasantly warm, with soft breezes floating in from the warm seas and gently billowing, rolling white clouds in the sky. The gods live there contentedly, subject only to the will of Odin, the All Father, who had given them life and created their world. Odin was lord of Asgard because he was the oldest and wisest of the gods, and there was no one who challenged his rule. Odin knew from time immemorial that the threat of Ragnarok, the twilight of the gods, had to be faced, and all his time was spent trying to prepare for it. In the first days, he built his castle on the highest of Asgard's peaks, where only eagles build their nests, and named it Hildskjalf. The high nest from where he could observe all that was going on in the nine worlds. Odin's task was a heavy burden for him, for power brings with it responsibility, and so he sought help wherever he could get it. He was assisted in his labors by four supernatural beings: a pair of wolves named Freki, Swallowall, and Jerry, Rumbling Belly, and a pair of ravens called Hugin, which means thought, and Munin. Which means memory. Only Odin could sit on the high throne at the top of Asgard, where the winds roared and gaze out over the nine worlds. When another being sat in his place, it would bring dire calamity in its wake. But that was in the distant future. The nine worlds were full of strange and magical beings. Between Asgard and Vanaheim lived the bright elves and the dwarves. Niflheim was home to the dark elves and rock trolls and the ice giants. In Jotunheim lived the storm and mountain giants, and in Muspelheim, dreaded Surt and the fire demons. In the beginning, as Asgard existed outside time, none of these dire beings had any effect on the paradisical existence of the gods. Odin, however, watched and learned. Planning so as to prevent, or at least be prepared for the final great clash between the cosmic powers of good and evil, the twilight of the gods, Ragnarok. As well as his ravens and his wolves, Odin had an eight-legged, winged horse named Sleipnir, which was the fastest steed in creation and was capable of transporting him anywhere among the nine worlds. He also possessed a magical spear named Gungnir, which once cast always transfixed its target, then returned to its master's hand, having done its deadly work. Odin's was a solitary existence, and much of his time was spent away from his wife Frigg, who lived alone in her palace Fensalir in the west of Asgard. Her beautiful face was made serious by the sad expression in her eyes that came from the knowledge of the gods' final destiny. When not studying the ebb and flow of good and evil in the nine worlds, Odin would go down into the world of men and directly intervene in their affairs. He always went disguised when he did this and took many different names and forms. Odin was a god to be feared and could never be taken lightly. When Asgard's golden age passed over, his chief interest in men was to gather from among them the heroes and the champions, the great warriors and those who died bravely in battle. These were transported by the Valkyries, the choosers of the slain, to the great hall of Valhalla in Asgard. The Valkyries were immortal warrior maidens who rode winged horses. And chose only the most valiant to take back to Valhalla with them. Valhalla was the Viking heaven, where the bravest warriors were eternally reunited with their comrades to spend their days in bloody battle and their nights in feasting. The magical food and drink of Valhalla brought those wounded or slain in each day's combat back to life, wholly renewed, ready to fight again the next day. So they lived on, training eternally, killing and being killed, honing their skills for the coming of Ragnarok. The Vikings of Midgard or Earth worshipped Odin, and while most were feared warriors in their own right, 
There grew up among them a special cult of warriors who dedicated their existence to his service. They wore the skins of bears or wolves and lived apart from their fellow men. They were called the berserks or berserkers, and in battle were renowned for their absolute ferocity and total absence of fear. The berserkers loved the roar of battle and the scent of death, and lived only to fight and kill, wishing only to be killed themselves one day and join Odin among the fallen in Valhalla as a reward for their courage and dedication to their lord. Their normal warrior's job was to protect the berserkers' back, but this could be a doubly dangerous task, as in the heat of a berserk rage, they would often fail to distinguish friend from foe and kill any who came within striking distance. We still use the word berserk today to describe someone who flies into a mad rage. the gods of Asgard. After Odin, the best loved of the gods, at least by mortal man, was his son Thor, the red-haired, red-bearded god of the thunder and the lightning. Thor was the most powerful of the other gods, and was also referred to as the thunderer, the smiter, and the defender of Asgard and Midgard. To help him fight the terrible enemies of Asgard, Thor possessed a number of magical items. Best known and most feared of these was his enchanted warhammer, Mjolnir, whose name means the Destroyer, with which he killed many of his foes. Mjolnir would always return to its owner when thrown, and was so heavy none but Thor could wield it. He could also use it to call forth thunder, lightning, and the tempest when the need arose. As well as being an invincible warrior, Thor was a great eater and entertainer. His castle was called Bilskirnir, or the lightning, and was situated in a region of Asgard known as the Fields of Strength. It was the biggest in Asgard, with 540 rooms. He lived there with his beautiful wife, Sif, the goddess of the wheat fields. She was famed for her long, shining, blonde hair, which was like spun gold. Their table groaned and creaked from the weight of food and drink that was piled on it for meals and banquets. Thor had an appetite every bit as voracious as he was impulsive, and thought nothing of eating a whole ox at a single sitting and washing it down with three barrels of nectar-sweet mead. In reality, he was something of a glutton, but he was so brave and strong, everyone loved him, and did not care about how much he ate or drank. Next to Thor, in strength, was a mysterious and silent god named Vidar, whose task was to create a magical object named the Greatest Boot. This boot was to be made from the scraps of all the leather that all mortal cobblers threw away in making footwear for their clients. At the end of time, when the ship of death set sail and the giants attacked Asgard, Vidar will put on the greatest boot, and if the magic works, will use it to stamp out the life of one of the gods' deadliest enemies. Another of the gods who often went down to the world of men was Heimdall, but not much is known about his origins. Heimdall was the guardian of Asgard, and lived in a fort on Bifrost, the rainbow bridge itself, protecting Asgard from all manner of dangers. Heimdall's senses were so keen that he could hear grass growing on Midgard, or a leaf falling to the earth in Jotunheim. On his shoulder hung the great Jalahorn, the trumpet that would sound the final alarm when the giants and the forces of evil began their attack on Asgard. Heimdall would be the first to face the forces of evil when Ragnarok dawned, and no finer sentinel existed in all the nine worlds. Another important god was the war god Tyre, whose runes marked the swords and axes of mortal men. 
Tyre was the son of Odin, and if anything, was even braver than Thor, but not quite so powerful as his brother. Tyre would have to make a great sacrifice for the good of Asgard before the coming of Ragnarok. Baldur, the son of Odin, was Thor's brother and was known as the White God or the Shining One or the Beautiful, and was loved by all the gods but one, the evil Loki. Baldur was loved by all things in creation, and because of a prophecy that he would one day be slain by treachery. Frigg, who was the mother of everything in nature, made all things swear that they would never harm her beloved son, so that he should not die by fire, stone, metal, wood, or water. Even so, it would come to pass that Baldur would die at the hand of his brother, the blind god Hodur, and this event would presage the coming of Ragnarok. <laughs> The god who was really responsible for the coming of Ragnarok more than any other was not innocent blind Hodur, but the god who, as we shall see, duped him into killing his brother Baldur, the god of mischief and evil Loki. Though physically beautiful and possessing a beguiling charm, right from the beginning Loki was a troublesome spirit with a nasty, mean, spiteful streak that led him. And eventually, all Asgard into serious trouble. Odin, it has to be said, found Loki's cunning and twisted, evil way of thinking quite attractive in many ways, and played with him, much as children play with matches, not quite realizing the true danger until they get burned. Thinking that it could be to Asgard's benefit to bring Loki into the fold and turn him away from his evil ways. Odin made him his blood brother by cutting their wrists and letting their blood mingle. But ultimately, it was to be of no avail. Loki would be known as the tainted god, the bad companion, and the thief of Sif's hair, among other despicable things. Before he eventually brought doom upon them all, Loki's offspring, as much as he himself, were to be the bane and scourge of Asgard. Although the god of mischief had a beautiful, loving wife in Asgard named Sigyn, he also had three children to an ogress in Jotunheim named Angrobod. Angrobod, like her lover, was a mixture of beauty and evil. Their first daughter was called Gerda, and she was a beauty without compare in the nine worlds, and she would play an important part in the discord that was to come. The second child of Loki and Angrobod was a wolf, and they called him Fenrir. As the wolf cub was a child of Loki, the gods let him play in the forests of Asgard, little realizing the danger they were allowing into their homeland, and how dear their kindness would cost them and Tyr, the god of war, in particular. Loki and Angrobod's third child was a monstrous serpent called Jormungandr. Who grew so big that in no time he surrounded the whole of Midgard. Odin, in order to prevent the monster getting any bigger, put the serpent's tail in its mouth and threw it in the sea, where it endlessly twists and coils, creating the waves and the tides. Hjormungandr is also known as the Midgard serpent, and is the sworn enemy of Thor, with whom it would clash on more than one occasion. The fourth child of the terrible pair was a girl, and Odin hurled her into the underworld, fearing what a terrible monster she might grow into. She fell from the towering black granite cliffs of Asgard for seven days and seven nights, and landed in a dark and gloomy place called Hell. Because of the magical powers inherited from her parents, she grew into the queen of that land and took its name for her own, Hela. The entrance to Hell is a huge, gaping black hole called Nipphalir, which means the cave in the cliff, and from its dark mouth blow icy winds and blinding sheets of snow. 
The entrance is guarded by a terrible hound called Garm, who is so savage he has to be chained in place to prevent him charging out into the nine worlds and attacking all who live there. The denizens of hell include those mortal men who have murdered, betrayed, or broken their word in life, and their punishment is eternal. There is an island in hell called Nastrand, or the shore of the dead, that the light of day never reaches. It has only one building, a huge torture chamber. The building is made from poisonous living serpents, and those who enter are endlessly punished for their sinful lives. Burning venom drips on the evil doers, whose bodies are already a mass of open cuts and wounds. From having had to cross the dread river Slid, which is filled not with water but razor-sharp swords and knives, and the serpents bite at them interminably, allowing them no respite or comfort. The eternally living dead of hell, when they are not being tortured, are put to work building the terrible longship of the goddess of death. When the ship is finished. Its captain will be the great traitor, the evil one who betrayed his friends and loved ones, wicked Loki, and it will sail against Odin and Asgard when the time of Ragnarok comes around. <laughs> Yggdrasil, the world tree, and the three Norns, the weavers of destiny. Among the many mysteries in the creation of the universe, one of the deepest is that of Yggdrasil, the world tree. The great ash was the source of the driftwood logs, both ash and elm, into which Odin breathed life to create man and woman. But where it came from, how it grew out of the great nothingness, or the lands of fire and ice, or even if it existed before all of them, is a mystery. Mortal men cannot see Yggdrasil, for it is invisible. But it links all the nine worlds, joining heaven, earth, and hell. Now the origins of the Norns too is a mystery. They were the three sisters of the giant Narfi, the father of night. They came out of Jotunheim and made their home in Asgard, in the cave where the roots of Yggdrasil went into the ground. They guarded the world tree's roots from all danger and contamination. Mixing a magical paste from the waters of the well, with which they coated the roots of the tree every day, to prevent it ever becoming dried out or rotten. When they were not caring for the tree, they spent their days spinning the cloth of destiny, weaving in the threads of each man's life, though they seemed to record it rather than ordain it. Every day, the gods would go to the Norns to look at the picture of their destiny. Which the Norns were weaving, and debate and plan how to delay the fatal day of Ragnarok, which they knew was inevitable. Yggdrasil's second route was in Jotunheim, the land of the giants, and at its foot there was another well, that of Mimir. In earlier times, Mimir himself had been a god, but in the age of Asgard, only his head remained. Mimir's head drank daily from the waters of knowledge, which bubble out of his well, and he knows the past, present, and future. Odin would have to go to Mimir and drink from the waters of the well to acquire the knowledge needed to save himself and his race from the final destruction threatened by Ragnarok. But the price of wisdom would be high. The third route sinks deep down into the heart of Niflheim. And there it is splashed by the evil broth of Virgilmir, where there is a huge nest of hissing, poisonous vipers, and a terrible dragon named Nithog, who gnaws endlessly at the roots of the world tree. 
Four huge stags eat the bark of the tree, and in the bowl of Yggdrasil nests an ancient and malignant eagle. This realm is linked by the subterranean passageways to the dark and gloomy domain of hell. The queen of the underworld, Hela, sits almost always alone in her huge, empty palaces. She receives the visits of evil men who had lived dishonorable lives and died badly, offering them what she has to eat from a plate called hunger, with a knife and fork of famine. Stupidity is her handmaiden. And senility, her servant, and the threshold of her palace is called trickery. She is a bloodless, horrifying creature with fetid breath and baleful eyes, one green, one red, and none of those who go to her ever feel the warmth of the sun or know joy again. The Apples of Edoun. The gods of Asgard, or the Aesir as they were also known, owed their continued immortality to the goddess Edoun, who cultivated the orchard of the golden apples of eternal life. This is the story of how Edoun and the golden apples were once stolen from Asgard, and what the consequences of that theft were. One fine day, when all was well in Asgard, Odin and his brother Hener decided to take a trip outside the realm of the gods and do a little hunting. Now Loki, the god of mischief, heard about this and, being bored in Asgard because he had no one to tease and provoke, as Thor had gone off to fight with the storm giants in Jordanheim, and Baldur was wandering around somewhere down on Midgard, immediately invited himself along for the trip. The three gods set off on foot and spent the first night in a great wood, sleeping under their cloaks beneath the canopy of the skies after eating the provisions they had brought along with them. The following day, they marched for many, many miles, crossing rivers and climbing mountains, until they found themselves in rocky, empty terrain. They camped for the night next to a trickling mountain stream, so they had plenty to drink. But caught nothing to eat to satisfy the whining pangs of hunger that had begun to creep into their bellies. The next day, they decided to keep marching north and continue their exploration of the barren foothills in which they found themselves. Eventually, just before dusk, they came across a herd of unbranded cattle on the edge of a dark forest, stomachs rumbling with hunger as they had not eaten for over twenty hours. Hanir knocked an arrow to his great hunting bow and shot a particularly large and succulent-looking ox from a range of about eight hundred yards. The beast died instantly when the arrow struck, and the three Asgardians immediately built a fire and prepared to cook their kill. When the ox had been roasting on a spit for a good hour, Odin, his stomach rumbling and his mouth watering, tore off a leg and took a bite. Only to spit the flesh out in surprise, because it tasted as raw and cold as if it had never been cooked. Odin frowned, and Loki continued to turn the spit. Henir throwing more wood on the fire to build up the heat and speed up the cooking. After another hour, Henir took his knife and cut off a strip of the calf's blackened flesh. He too spat out the meat, which, even though the carcass was well charred on the outside and smoking, remained raw and cold. There's something fishy going on here," said Odin, scratching his bearded chin thoughtfully. "Smells like magic to me, brother," said Henir. Just then, a loud screeching voice shouted out. Sirt, the fire demon couldn't cook that meat unless I allowed it. So you, as guardians, haven't got a hope. The three gods who had thought they were alone spun around, scanning the trees and bushes for the source of the voice. But at first, they could see nobody. Then Odin shouted imperiously, "Who are you? Come out and show yourself!" With that, 
an enormous eagle that had been perched at the top of a gnarled and ancient oak tree swooped down and perched on one of the thick lower boughs. You're wasting your time. That meat won't cook unless I allow it, said the eagle in a gloating tone. Now Odin, who didn't like it when supernatural eagles didn't answer his questions and kept him from eating his dinner, snapped. Well, do so then. Or is it your way to starve visitors to death in your land? The eagle retorted, Only if you promise to let me eat my fill first. After all, they are my cattle. Realizing that they faced a magic as powerful as their own, and as they were a long way from home, and getting hungrier by the minute, the gods quickly agreed to the eagle's demand. Give it another minute and that'll do it then said the eagle, jumping off its perch and flapping to the ground as it spoke. A minute later, the roasted carcass was on the ground in front of the giant eagle, and it began to rip off huge chunks of succulent-looking, wonderful-smelling meat. However, the god's initial wonderment soon turned to annoyance and then anger, as the greater part of the carcass was gobbled up in a matter of minutes, and in record time all they were left with was a few bones. Loki, who was a greedy glutton at the best of times, was livid at being tricked by the eagle, and in a fit of rage picked up a solid, knotty oaken branch from the ground, intending to batter the eagle, break its skull and cut it open to get back all the meat it had wolfed down. But the eagle leapt into the air, avoiding the blow, and caught the club in its claws as it shot skywards. Taken by surprise at the speed of the great bird, Loki had no time to release his grip, and promptly found himself shooting up above the treetops as the mighty eagle soared skywards. Try as he might, Loki could not release his grip, and as he was carried higher and higher, shouting to the other gods to help him, he realized that he was in the clutches of a dangerously powerful magical being. The eagle flew over the treetops for a while, every now and again allowing Loki's legs to bang into the upper branches, which felt like being birched. Then it took him to a huge rocky cliff and began to scrape him along its edge. The now impotent god of mischief was anything but amused and roared at the top of his voice, Let me down, you feathered monster! You don't know who you're trifling with! Let me down or you will rue the day you crossed my path! The fierce-eyed eagle just glared at him, though, then flew even faster and higher than before. Blustering and threats having failed, the terrified Loki, whose arms by now felt like they were going to pop out of their sockets, began to plead and bleat for mercy. Oh, please, mighty eagle, let me down. I'll do anything you ask of me. Please, just let me down. The eagle at this point, judging Loki to be sufficiently terrified, screeched at him. Foolish, arrogant little god! Know now that I'm no eagle but the giant Thiasi, and unless you swear to bring me the goddess Idun and the golden apples of immortality, I will fly seven miles up into the sky and drop you like a stone, and your body will be broken like an egg smashed by a hammer. To Loki, it seemed they must already be that high, because he could make out nothing of the earth below, and he shouted, Yes, yes, whatever you say, I'll, I'll do anything, only please let me down. Let you down? Yes, I shall let you down. But I'm warning you, you'd better not break your promise, or this is what will happen, hissed the eagle, and so saying, dropped the wriggling Loki. Loki shot earthward like an arrow fired from a bow, going faster and faster, until it seemed he must crash into the rocky gully at the foot of the cliffs. With only feet to go before impact, the eagle swooped to his rescue and plucked him out of the air, flying up once again to the cliff top, where he deposited the trembling god, dropping him from a height of ten feet, so that he landed in an unceremonious heap on the floor, bruised and frightened, but otherwise unharmed. Flapping away into the sky, the eagle barked as it departed. A month from today, in the old glade of the hare, in the woods outside Asgard, and remember, no tricks, or I will break you like an egg. Whinging and moaning, the startled Loki limped his way back down into the woods, where he could still see the smoke from Odin and Henir's fire. 
He decided to say nothing about the truth of what had happened to him, because Thiassi had put a giant fear into him. The three gods, fed up with meat that couldn't be cooked and giant talking eagles that stole their dinner, decided to return to Asgard. When he got back to Asgard, the cowardly Loki spent four tormented weeks turning over all the possibilities in his head, trying to take into account every possible eventuality. He realized what a disaster it would be for the Aesir to lose Idun and her golden apples. Without them, the gods would begin to age and feel pain like mortals. Old age and eventually death was a certain result. But Loki could only think of being dropped onto a rocky floor from seven miles high. One morning, two days before he was due to deliver Idun to the giant, Loki's wife was preparing breakfast, and an egg she had placed on the table rolled off and fell onto the stone floor of the kitchen, breaking with a sickly splatting sound. The god of mischief winced and paled visibly, and went back to bed without eating anything, complaining of a headache. When the fatal day arrived, seeing no other way out of his dilemma, Loki decided to go and seek out Idun and trick her into going with him into the woods where the giant Thiazi would be waiting. He found her, as usual, in her orchard, singing the song of springtime to the flowers, bushes, and trees. Knowing the goddess of springtime's weakness, he chatted amiably for a while, waiting for the hour just before dusk. Then baited his trap, said that he had seen a tree in the woods outside Asgard that bore golden fruit that looked identical to the apples of eternal life. Idun was puzzled, for she knew of no such tree, and being sweet and innocent, had no idea that Loki was laying a trap for her to be kidnapped. Suggesting that they take a basket full of the apples of eternal life with them for making comparisons. He offered to take her to the glade of the hare and show her the remarkable tree he had found. Suspecting nothing, Idun picked up her basket and set off with Loki. Where the goddess walked on grass, flowers sprang up behind her, but Loki summoned a pair of ravens to follow behind them and eat the flowers, so that there would be nothing to mark their passing. Loki took great care to make sure that they were not seen when they left Asgard. Telling Idun to put her hood up against the evening dew, but he reckoned without Heimdall, who heard the unusual sound made by the flowers which grew behind Idun as she walked. Even though Heimdall was so far away that neither Loki nor Idun even realized he was watching them, he could see the sweet smile on her face and the cornflower blue eyes that could melt the very ice of winter. Things looked innocent enough. But he was aware of Loki's black, flickering eyes, which always reminded him of someone peeping out of a window from behind the curtains, wanting to see what everyone else was doing, but not be seen himself, and the shining white teeth, grinning so like a wolf's as he walked hand in hand with the goddess. He had better not be up to more mischief, thought Heimdall to himself, or he will have the guardian of Asgard to deal with. Little dreaming the real seriousness of what Loki intended. Almost as soon as Loki and Idun reached the secluded part of the woods that Thiassi had indicated, the giant eagle appeared and snatched the goddess up in one huge taloned claw, and the basket containing the apples in the other, and off they flew to Jotunheim. The cowardly Loki scurried back to Asgard. The enormity of what he had done gradually dawning on him as he crept back into his home, taking great pains so that no one should see him. Within a matter of days, the gods became aware of Idun's absence. Their hair began to turn grey. And they began to notice aches and pains, small things, but things they had never experienced before. And various of them went to find Idun. When they realized that she was no longer in Asgard, and that the apples of eternal life were gone too, they grew concerned, and a council meeting was called. Once the gods were gathered, 
Heimdall told them what he had seen a few evenings earlier, and an angry Odin ordered his guards to go and find Loki and bring him before the council. The god of mischief was dragged into the council chamber, protesting his innocence. But it was impossible for him to conceal the truth from the enraged Odin and keen-eyed Heimdall. Odin swore eternal torture for Loki if he did not come clean, and before long the whole story was told, which caused uproar and cries for the execution of the guilty one. Realizing that the gods were in a serious mood and not joking, Loki swore that he would go to Jotunheim and rescue Idun and bring back the golden apples, as indeed he protested he had always planned to do. His only request was that the goddess Freya lent him her cloak of hawk's feathers, so that he could fly there disguised as a bird and enter the giant's castle undetected. This was granted, and Loki put on the magical cloak and took to the air, winging his way over the mountains and seas to the lands of the giants. Thiassi's castle was next to a lake and was surrounded by huge pine trees. Loki alighted in the uppermost branches of one of these trees and observed the castle until, at last, near dusk, he saw Thiassi coming out carrying a fishing rod, get into a boat and row out into the middle of the lake. Seizing his opportunity, the god of mischief flew around the castle until he saw Idun sitting sadly in one of the bedrooms. And he flew in through the window. The goddess gave a startled cry when a hawk the size of a man came in through the window. But removing the cloak so that she could see who he was, Loki cautioned her to silence. Fear not, Tidun. It is I, Loki. I've come to rescue you, but don't make any noise. Don't worry. I'm going to turn you into a walnut and carry you back to Asgard. So saying, he made a series of passes with his hands, and suddenly the goddess was a large brown walnut. Donning the magical cloak again, Loki transformed once more into a hawk, picked the nut up in his claw, and jumped out of the window, setting off in the direction of Asgard. Thiassi would not have realized anything had happened had it not been for his daughter Skadi, who came into Idun's room just in time to see the hawk flying out of the window with a nut in its claw. And realized that something was amiss. Grabbing one of the giant candles, she lit it and waved it back and forth until the movement caught her father's attention out on the lake. Thiazi rode back to his castle and bounded up the stairs four at a time to ask his daughter what was wrong. When she told him Idun had escaped, he flew into a rage and immediately ran to put on his suit of eagle's feathers. Roaring Loki's name and swearing to kill him, he flew off in pursuit. Loki was half way back to Asgard and felt sure that they would be safe once behind the gleaming realm's walls. But Thiazi could fly much faster than Loki, and he rapidly began to gain ground on the fleeing gods. Heimdall witnessed it all, and as he described what he was seeing, all the other gods mounted the battlements of Asgard to see what was happening. At first, they could only see two specks in the distance, but they quickly got larger, and soon it began to seem probable that the eagle would overtake the hawk before it reached the battlements, though it would be a close contest. Of all the gods, only Tyr had the presence of mind to anticipate what was needed, and he called to Baldur and Frey to help him pile up wood and crates and timber just outside the battlements. Once the pile of wood was higher than the battlements themselves, he poured oil on it, lit the torch, and then waited. As Loki drew nearer, the giant bearing down on him, the gods began to urge him on, giving him just the extra strength and speed he needed to evade the clutch of the eagle's talons. Loki passed over the battlements just seconds in front of Thiassi, but as soon as he did, Tyr lit the great pile of oil-soaked wood. The giant, who had not seen Tyr's trap in the twilight, flew into a roaring wall of flame and exploded into a huge fireball himself. The magical eagle's feathers igniting like dry grass on a summer's day. Thiassi was totally incinerated, except for his sapphire blue eyes, which were indestructible and ended up embedded in the wall as a result of the impact. 
Loki and Idun landed in Asgard, and the goddess of spring was met by cheers and laughter, though Loki received only the sharp side of the god's tongues and many a pointing finger. Before long, the aging immortals were eating of the enchanted fruit. The gods were for punishing Loki, wanting to torture or exile him because of his former treachery, but he pleaded with Odin to remember their blood oath. The arguments went back and forwards into the night, and torches were lit to dispel the darkness. And who knows what would have happened had it not been for a new emergency. The ever watchful Heimdall gave the alarm. And the gods swarmed to the parapets to see, marching towards them out of the darkness, the fully armed and armored Skadi, the daughter of the dead giant, who had followed her father in order to help him, but had arrived too late. Now Skadi had with her some very powerful enchanted weapons that her father, in his haste to chase after Loki and Idun, had not had time to pick up. These weapons made her an adversary worthy of respect, for they could kill even immortals. So Odin began to parley with her, asking her what she wanted. Retribution for my dead father is what I want," said the grim-faced Skadi, turning her dead father's magic axe in her hands, apparently determined to have blood revenge. Odin, though, explained the full story to Skadi. And managed to convince her that her father had brought his destruction upon himself, suggesting that they could compensate her in some way for what she had lost. What can take the place of my now dead father? Asked the giantess challengingly, and it was crafty Loki who responded quick as a flash. What about a live husband, mighty princess? One of the gods of Asgard, perhaps. Many there are who could make you happy and brighten the lonely darkness of the long nights ahead in Jotunheim. The shining face of Baldur the Beautiful caught Skadi's eye, and without a second's hesitation, she responded, "Done. I accept your offer, but I want him." Pointing to the shining one as she spoke, and now Loki knew that the Asgardians, who loved Baldur dearly, would not allow him to be whisked off to Jotunheim. So he craftily manipulated the situation, flattering the giantess shamelessly to save his skin. But beauteous Skadi, if you take Baldur just like that, it will not be fair on all the other gods, who I can see would jump at the chance of winning your hand. Let there be a competition to decide who shall receive the honor. This really set the cat among the pigeons, because in truth, the grim-faced giantess. In her father's war helm and brandishing his magical battle axe was no one's idea of a desirable future wife, and the gods began arguing amongst themselves as to who should be the luckless sacrificial husband. Eventually, Odin decided the matter and declared that Skadi should choose her husband to be, but that she must do so solely by looking at his feet. A great wooden screen was brought, and all the eligible bachelors of Asgard, and some not so eligible, stood behind it, barefooted. Skadi was brought before the screen, which was raised ten inches from the ground, so that only the god's feet could be seen. She had to pick the god whose feet she found most appealing. After a few minutes of inspecting the feet behind the screen, she noticed one pair of feet that were whiter than all the others. And thinking they must belong to Baldur, she picked them. Imagine her surprise when the god who walked around from the other side of the screen turned out to be none other than Njord, the sea god, whose feet were so white from the amount of time he spent standing in the surf, looking out over his watery domain. Being a god, though, he was considerably more handsome than anything Skadi was used to mixing with in Jotunheim, and so, feeling only slightly disgruntled. The giantess from the mountains married the god of the sea. The wedding was held in Asgard, and in all the commotion, the gods pretty well forgot about the fix Loki had gotten them into, and that was how the wily Loki saved himself from the wrath of the gods on that occasion.
Empire lost his hand. Directly or indirectly, Loki was always causing trouble in Asgard. One instance which cost the war god Tyr dear came as a result of the birth of the mischievous one's monstrous son, the wolf Fenrir. Now Fenrir was the offspring of Loki and Angrabot, the giantess, and in the beginning, when he was just a furry little cub with milk teeth, the gods found him funny and adorable and were very affectionate with him. One or other of them was always to be found stroking or playing with him or feeding him some tasty morsel. However, this did not last for long because Fenrir grew at an alarming rate and the milk teeth were soon replaced by great needle-sharp white fangs and the little ball of bones and fur rapidly became a great black heavily muscled wolf with the flickering black eyes of its father. Odin realized that something would have to be done when he was out walking in the forest one day. As he passed by close to Fenrir's den, he saw the beast, as big as an ox by now, stalk and kill one of the huge boar that roamed there. Fenrir leapt on the squealing wild pig and killed it with a single raking slash of his huge saber-clawed paw, and then gobbled it down whole, crunching up bones, hooves and tusks in the process. Odin consulted the Norns, and they prophesied that one day Fenrir would do terrible damage to the Aesir, and would gobble up the king of the gods himself. So he ordered the making of, and would gobble up the king of the gods himself. So he ordered the making of an unbreakable chain to bind the beast before it got even bigger and stronger. As Thor was off battling giants, the task of binding Fenrir fell to the god of war, Tyre, who, as well as being one of the bravest gods as befitted his office, was also the most cunning after Loki. Tyre carried the great chain called Loding, coiled onto his shoulder, and said to Fenrir, Ho, oh, little wolf cub, I have a new game for us to play. A game to test your strength. Let us see if you can break this little chain that I have found. Now the chain was of toughened steel, with links as thick as a fat man's finger and thumb. But Fenrir by now was the size of a large shire horse, and he just snickered at Tyre's suggestion. The god chained the compliant wolf who sat down unconcerned as Tyre looped the steel links over its great neck and around each leg. When the chain was securely fastened, Tyre challenged it to try and get loose. With a bored yawn, Fenrir lazily got to his feet and stretched. The chain snapped, links springing into the air and clattering noisily onto the rocky ground. Fenrir smiled at Tyre, saying nothing. Tyre went back to Odin and told him what had happened, so a second chain was ordered to be forged, one much thicker and stronger than loading. This chain was called Dromi, and each link was as thick as a strong man's wrist. The gods smiled and laughed when they handled it, believing that not even a monster like Fenrir would be able to break it, however hard he tried. Tyre, though, had witnessed the ease with which the wolf had broken free of loading, and was not so sure. But, as there was nothing else to be done, he set off once again to challenge Fenrir to be bound. When the god found Fenrir, he was shocked to see that he had grown even bigger, and was about the size of a Viking dragon ship. The other gods accompanied Tyre this time to witness the binding, for there were those among them who, although not willing to get so close to the monster themselves, felt sure that Tyre had exaggerated or had not fastened the chain properly the last time. Fenrir eyed the chain thoughtfully. Then he allowed Tyre to bind him, just as he had done the last time. The great wolf sat chained and wriggled a little as if the bonds were uncomfortable, and then it lay with its muzzle on its paws, watching the god's reaction. Some began to rub their hands and slap each other on the backs. The chain had held this time, and the threat posed by Fenrir was over. 
They had all more or less relaxed, except Tyre and Odin, when the wolf let out a long, baleful howl and leapt to its feet, snapping the mighty chain in a dozen places as if it was so much glass, shaking its great body to sprinkle the rocky ground with the broken lengths of chain and shattered links. The wolf chuckled and wandered off into the woods to find something to eat. The gods walked back to Asgard, muttering and truly preoccupied, for Fenrir was a problem that already looked like being impossible to control, and he was getting bigger and stronger all the time. Now the greatest metal workers and smiths were the dwarves, who lived in the kingdom of the bright elves, and since a chain fit to bind Fenrir could not be forged in Asgard, Odin sent Skimir to the dwarves to tell them of the problem. Now the master smith was a dwarf named Geridor, and he was also a powerful magician. When Skimir told him of the problem, the dwarf shook his head and said such a task required powerful enchantments and a good deal of time. Skimir left for Asgard with instructions to come back in a month's time. After the month had passed, he returned, and the dwarf had completed the task. To Skimir's surprise, what Geridor had made was not a chain, but a silken rope. Skimir could not hide his disappointment, began to protest. A silken cord to bind Fenrir? Are you mad? Do you realize how strong the beast is, how large he has grown? Geridor let him go on a bit before giving him a goblet of elf mead and saying to him, Don't be deceived by appearances. This is a very special rope. And it's taken me this long to make, because I have had to find six very special ingredients. Increasingly perplexed, Skimir huffed sceptically. What special ingredients? It looks like an ordinary silk rope to me. Whispering confidentially into Skimir's ear, as if he did not want anyone to overhear his trade secrets, Geridor said, The spit of a bird, the nerves of a bear. The breath of a fish, the roots of a mountain, the beard of a woman, and the sound of a cat's footfall. The incredulous Skimir spluttered protestingly, The sound of a cat's footfall, the spit of a bird, the beard of a, a, a woman? Are you mad? These things don't exist. Geridor looked over his shoulder and from side to side, as if to make sure no one was eavesdropping and hissed. That's why they're so hard to find, stupid. Not knowing what to think, Skimir paid for the rope and set off back to Asgard, shaking his head and muttering to himself. When the gods saw the silken cord, they laughed at Skimir and claimed that he had been cheated, and an argument broke out. But Odin silenced their wagging tongues, for he knew that Geridor's fame was well-founded, and insisted that they must try to bind Fenrir with the cord. So a group of the bravest and strongest gods set out to confront Tyre, and when they found him, they asked him to come with them to the wastelands lying beyond Asgard and Niflheim. The wolf, who was by now as big as a full-grown dragon, felt that he was so strong he had nothing to fear from any god. He smiled, agreeing to go with them. So they set off northwards, and Fenrir padded along confidently in their company. They took a ferry across the dark lake Amsfartnir, and Tyre suggested disembarking on the island of Lingvi for a spot of hunting, as there were huge fat oxen there that tasted delicious roasted on an open fire. Fenrir growled, I prefer my meat hot, raw, and bloody, not burned and crisp by fire. And I'd like to kill it myself. But I'm hungry, so let's do as you say. Once on the island, the gods killed and roasted a huge ox, and were horrified to see the enormous appetite of Fenrir, who hunted down and gobbled up at least twenty while they were eating. His great appetite temporarily satiated, Fenrir sat down licking his chops, occasionally glancing at the gods as they washed down their foods with jugs of beer. Finally, Tyre stood up and said, O oh, Fenrir, 
I hope that little snack has left you feeling strong, because I've come across a rope none of the gods can snap, and I bet you won't be able to either. Fenrir eyed the silken rope, which was called Gleipnir, and he snarled. Bah! It looks like a shoelace. Snapping that's hardly going to enhance my reputation, is it? One by one, the gods tried to convince him to let himself be bound. But he sensed a trap and would not let them persuade him. Eventually, Odin said, "Look, Fenrir, if you let us bind you, and then you cannot snap this little rope, then we'll know you're not as strong as everyone says you are, won't we? And so there'll be no need for us to fear you, will there? In which case, we'll release you. Oh, come on, be a sport. What are you afraid of?" Sensing trickery and having the coming of a wolf, as well as the blood of the god of mischief flowing through his veins, but not wanting to seem cowardly, Fenrir replied, "I'm not too keen on this, and I don't really trust you as guardians. But I'll let you try and bind me on one condition: that one of you puts his hand in my mouth, so that if I cannot break free, I have some guarantee that you will release me afterwards, or one of you loses his right hand. So, what's it to be then, eh?" Who feels brave? Now, looking into the great black wolf's baleful green eyes and the huge grinning mouth filled with teeth like razor-sharp daggers, no one wanted to try their hand. But Tyre, who was the bravest of all, realizing that this would be their last and only opportunity to try and bind the monster, stepped forward, saying, "What an untrusting cuss you are, Fenrir! It's only a game, isn't it?" Come on then, I'll play if you will. With that, he put his right hand, his sword hand, in Fenrir's mighty jaws, and the great wolf grinned contentedly as the gods set about tying him with silken rope. When the final knot was tied, the wolf strained and struggled, but the more he struggled, the tighter the rope bit into him, causing him to whine with pain more than once. At last, he had to admit defeat and demanded to be freed. The delighted gods just laughed and jeered at his request, all except Tyre, who knew what was coming next. The enraged wolf bit through the war god's wrist and swallowed his hand in a single gulp. Blood spurted everywhere, and Baldur went to the screaming Tyre's assistance as the monster howled its shame and rage at having been tricked and bound by the Asgardians. To be doubly sure, and to prevent the wolf from hobbling away to look for help, Odin took another chain as thick as Dromi had been and passed it through the rope. Then, fixing it to a metal spike, he drove it down deep into the granite floor of the island, and then the gods picked up an enormous boulder. And they placed it on top of the spike, so that no one could try to dig it out. Fenrir could still move his head, and he growled and snarled and snapped at the Asgardians in his rage, and then began to howl for help. As he howled, Tyr, the stump of his right wrist now bandaged, took his sword in his left hand and jammed it in Fenrir's mouth, the pommel digging into the lower jaw and the point sticking into its palate. So that he could neither bite nor howl, the look of hate and rage in the wolf's eyes would have frightened a mortal man to death. But at last he was safely bound, and that is what the gods did with Fenrir the wolf, the third son of evil Loki, and why the war god Tyr has only one hand. His hammer. Whenever tales are told of the mighty thunder god Thor, his hammer. Mjolnir is always mentioned, 
but many people do not know the tale of how Thor got his hammer. This is that story. Thor often shared his adventures with his half-brother Loki, the god of mischief. But because Loki was the way he was, and frequently caused unnecessary problems and spoiled things, the Thunder God often preferred to go off on his own and get into trouble by himself, especially with giants, and then fight his way out. One day the two gods had arranged to depart for the land of the elves and see what adventures could be had there, but Loki was late. Thor, fed up with waiting for the crafty one, who was always late for everything, decided to teach Loki a lesson and left without him, crashing through the skies in his great chariot drawn by his magical rams. Loki arrived just in time to see Thor departing over the horizon and was both highly annoyed and offended that the Thunder God had not waited for him. That night Loki sat at home drinking mead and dark wines, brooding on what Thor had done. He went to bed half drunk and tossed and turned all night, scheming and planning some way to be revenged on Thor that would not be too dangerous. In his heart of hearts he was truly scared of the red-haired thunder god, for he had seen him out-wrestle giants and knock down an oak tree with a single blow of his mighty fist. So although he wanted revenge, he did not want to directly anger Thor, since that was a very dangerous thing to do. The night wore on, and the god of mischief would think of nothing suitable, and the lack of a definite plan made it impossible for him to close his eyes and go to sleep. A few hours before dawn, the weary god kicked off the bed covers and dressed, deciding to go for a walk to help him to think more clearly. As he wandered through the moonlit streets, beneath the twinkling of a million stars, the warm night air caressing his face, he felt increasingly discontented and vindictive. Any other god would have been relaxed by the heady perfume of the night air, filled as it was with the scents of roses, jasmine, myrtle, and a dozen other subtle aromas. The beauty of Asgard beneath the moonlight should have taken away all of his cares and filled his heart with joy, but it only gave him a worse headache. He wandered aimlessly through the streets of Asgard, and without intending to go there, he eventually found himself outside Thor's palace. Such is often the way with evil, it finds a way to happen without apparently trying. Now Loki had not gone there on purpose, but seeing an open window in the apartments of the goddess Sif, Thor's wife, he decided to climb up the ivy which grew on a trellis outside the window and break into the thunder god's home. The evil one began to smile as he scaled the wall, feeling sure that a suitable act of vengeance would occur to him once he was inside. As he entered Thor and Sift's bedroom by the open window, he was rubbing his hands with glee, imagining the mischief he could do while Thor was away. Once inside the bedchamber, he crept around in the dark, silently as a cat, his greedy, malicious gaze running over everything the room contained, looking for something to steal or break, spoil or hide that would cause discord in Thor's life. As he scanned the room, his eyes stopped on the sleeping figure of the goddess Sif. The silver moonlight illuminated the great bed where she slept, and where it fell on her flowing mane of long blonde hair, all golden waves and ringlets, the image before Loki's eyes began to shimmer, and he had to clap his hands over his mouth and bend forwards to stop himself from laughing out loud. Intoxicated by the audacity of the idea that had occurred to him, and perhaps a little drunk with his own daring, the mead, the dark wine, and the moonlight, he went to the goddess's dressing table and picked up a pair of golden scissors that lay there. Then he approached the bed, quickly and quietly, and all the while exulting in the sheer badness of what he was doing. The evil one began lopping off Sif's beautiful golden hair. At first he had only intended to take a little, and perhaps plant the seeds of jealousy in the thunder god's mind, 
but he was carried away by the pleasure he got from letting his malice free, and forgetting all thought of any reprisals that might result from his actions, sheared the beautiful goddess until she was as bald as an egg. However, the god of mischief got too wrapped up in what he was doing, and before he knew it, the sky in the east was beginning to glow orange with the return of the sun. Sif began to mutter in her sleep and shift her position slightly. Stuffing the cut hair hurriedly into his shirt, Loki made a hasty exit, fearing that she was going to awake and catch him in the act. As Loki clambered out of the bedroom window and down the back side of the house, one of his sandals came off and dropped into a bush. Once on the ground, he made a rapid search for it, but fearing that he would be caught at the scene of the crime as day began to break, he was forced to leave without finding it. He hurried off, running through Thor's garden into the nearby woods. Disappearing before the dreaming Sif awakened, Loki got back home, hid Sif's hair under his mattress, and locked his door. Then climbed into bed, closed his eyes, and drifted off to sleep contentedly, chuckling at his cleverness. His slumber did not last long. When Sif awoke, her screams and wailing awoke half of Asgard, and just happened to coincide with Thor's return. The thunder god was absolutely furious to discover what had been done to his wife, who, for her part, was weeping inconsolably, completely unable to understand what had been done to her and why. Baldur's wife Nanna, who came running to see what the cause of all the commotion was, spotted Loki's fallen sandal and picked it up on the way into the house. When Thor saw it, he recognized it as Loki's at once. Because it had been stitched with gold and silver threads, unlike the plain leather of the typical Asgardian sandals, and he almost exploded with rage. This time it's gone too far, my Odin. I will snap him in two. I'll break his arms and legs. I'll tear him limb from limb. I'll crush every bone in his body. But Sif was even angrier than Thor and shouted at her husband, "A lot of good that will do you, Thunderhead! It won't get me my hair back, will it? Look at me! I look like one of the bald vultures of Niflheim, and it's all your fault. You as guardian oaf, do something!" The startled Thor had never seen Sif so angry, and he stormed out of his house. The thunder began to roll in the sky over Asgard, and the forks of jagged lightning flashed angrily as their master struggled to control his rage. Thor kicked down the door of Loki's house and burst into the bedroom, dragging the bleary-eyed and instantly terrified mischief maker out of bed. Wasting no time, he slammed him into a wall, shaking him like a terrier does a rat, roaring, "You misbegot!" Gotten serpent spawn eel slime curd dog, what have you done with my wife's hair? I'm going to tear you into little pieces and feed you to the crows. Had it not been for Loki's good wife Sigyn pleading and begging the Thunder God not to murder her husband, he might have choked the life out of him there and then, and saved everyone a lot of heartache in the future. But the Norns weave a tangled web. As Thor gripped Loki's neck in one great hand, and Sigyn hung on his right arm, beseeching him not to strike Loki with a great mace-like fist, the half-strangled Loki had the seconds he needed to react and managed to begin to wheedle and beg for mercy. Loki was a superb actor, and as his life was in danger. He put on a masterful performance of being repentant, swearing never to do anything ever again to offend Thor or Sif, and to make good the damage done. In a shameful display of whinging cowardice, he begged Thor's pardon. Salt tears streaming down his face, great heaving sobs racking his frame, sobbing like a baby, Loki wailed, "It was the dark wine of Jotunheim, Thor." I never drink it normally. It made me drunk. I hardly remember what I did. I would never do anything to offend you or yours, half brother. You're my best friend. I'm so sorry. Believe me. Please do not kill me. Yet, for though I surely deserve it, you will leave good Sigyn without a husband and my children without a father. 
but please let me make amends before I die for the terrible things I have done. Excuse followed apology, and remorse flowed in equal measure with good intentions, as Loki did everything in his power to make Thor withhold the final blow. Thor's great arm shook as his reason warred with his passion, and all the time Sigyn pleaded with him to spare her husband. Please, my lord, spare him. It was a stupid, drunken joke that went too far, nothing more. He didn't realise what he was doing. It's not really bad. He would never have hurt the Lady Sif. He loves me. Oh, please, great Thor, give him a chance to put right the wrong he has done to you. Fearing that this time he had really gone too far, Loki began to cajole and try to appease the furious Thunder God, saying, Listen, Thor, it'll be all right. I can fix everything. Look, I'll go to the dwarves and get them to make a hairpiece of the finest spun gold for Sif, even more beautiful than her own hair until it grows back. She can keep it, of course, and I'll get them to make magical gifts for Odin and our brother, Frey. I'll get them to make something special for you, too. Honestly, I will. Everything will be all right. You'll see. Trust me. I'll make it right with you. Fighting to control his rage, for when Thor got angry, it was not like an ordinary god's anger. He could not just switch it off, but had to release it somehow. The thunder god shook Sigyn free of his arm and sent a fist like a ham crashing towards Loki's head. The god of mischief shut his eyes and heard a terrifying crash. He opened his eyes and saw Thor's forearm just above his shoulder. The thunder god's fist was buried up to the wrist in one of the solid oak beams that held up the wall. Outside in the garden, a lightning bolt had blasted Loki's favourite cherry tree, splitting it in two and setting it on fire. Thor's icy blue eyes stared into Loki's impenetrable black ones, and he growled softly through clenched and grinding teeth. You have one week, half-brother. One week to make good your promises. If not, I will come looking for you, and not all the tears in creation will save you from your doom. Releasing the gasping Loki and leaving him rubbing his bruised throat, the Thunder God stormed out. Now Loki had had such a shock that he did not even stop to have breakfast. He dressed quickly and set off immediately to try and put things right, changing into a hawk and flying full speed to Svartalfaheim, the land of the Dark Elves. Fortunately for him, Loki had a debt to call in, for favours he had done for a band of elves known as the sons of Ivaldi. So he went to them and asked them to prepare a headpiece of the finest gold for Frey and gifts worthy of the gods. As well as being great smiths and metal workers, these dark elves were skilled in working gold and had considerable magic powers too, and in a couple of days produced three wondrous gifts. Sif's headpiece was a miraculous thing, spun from the finest golden threads, finer than the spider's web, and it shimmered and shone like the sun when it moved. For Odin, the dwarves created the magical spear Gungnir, which would always hit its target and return to his hand when thrown. And for Frey, they made a dragon ship called Skidblade, that would always find fair winds when it set sail, but which would shrink in size, so that he could pick it up and put it in his pocket whenever he was not using it. Once he saw these things, Loki regained his usual cheeky confidence and forgot about his promise to make a special gift to Thor. He put the hairpiece and the ship in a leather sack and picked up the spear and bid the dwarves farewell. As he walked, whistling and with a spring in his step, through the subterranean tunnels where the dwarves and elves live, he passed by the forge of Brock and Sindri, two brothers whose renown as smiths was legendary. Brock was standing in the doorway smoking a pipe, and as Loki drew near, he greeted him. Hello, Loki. That's a fine spear you carry there. Been shopping, have you? What have you got in that bag? 
The curiosity of the dwarves was legendary too, and each was always keen to know what their brothers and cousins were getting up to. So Loki was not taken aback by Brook's inquisitiveness, and indeed was feeling so pleased with himself that he began to boast in his usual arrogant way, saying, "Hello, Brook. Yes, it is rather a splendid spear, isn't it?" People say you and your brother are the finest smiths in Svartalfheim, but I bet my head that even you two couldn't make anything as good as what I've got in this bag. Now Loki said this without thinking, but really should have been more careful, because among the dwarves and the elves, betting is taken rather seriously. And no sooner were the words out of Loki's mouth than Brock, knocking out his pipe, said. Done. I'll take that bet. Loki's head, eh? Hmm. That'll be something to talk about now, wouldn't it, eh? A real god's head. Stepping inside the threshold of the forge, he shouted, "Sindri, stoke up the fire. There's work to be done. A challenge bet. Loki has wagered his head that we cannot outdo the gifts he carries." Then, turning to the dumbstruck god of mischief, Brock. Rubbing his hands and smiling, said, "Come on in, Loki. You can watch us work, and when we're finished, we'll all go to Asgard, and the gods can decide which is the best work. That'll be a good crack, won't it? If they don't think our work is better than what you carry in the bag, we'll make a gift of it to you. But if they do, then we'll cut off your head and bring it back here. Eh? I can't say fairer than that, can you? Oh, let's get cracking." Loki could have kicked himself. And wished that he had bitten his tongue before speaking. Odin help him if these two brothers were as good as they were said to be. Brock began pumping the bellows to heat up the coals of the forge, and Sindri began to prepare a huge crucible, dropping in lumps of gold ore and lining up a host of strange tools, the like of which Loki had never seen before. The two brothers soon became immersed in what they were doing. And did not notice that before long the crafty Loki had disappeared. As the crucible of ore heated up and reached the melting point, Sindri took a vial of some strange crimson liquid and carefully mixed in a few drops in the white hot gold. Then, when the gold was glowing with a red tinged radiance, he took a pig skin and, shouting to his brother to keep on pumping the bellows. He began to pour the liquid gold into the pigskin. Brock began to curse and swear as he worked the bellows, for a huge gadfly had flown into the forge and stung him on the neck, drawing blood. But he did not let him stop him from pumping the bellows. Sindri then took a huge pair of pincers and moved the gold-filled pigskin away from the forge, and poured a vial of blue liquid on it. There was a tremendous hissing sound, and the pigskin glowed red, white, then purest golden. Then, incredibly, it was no longer a pigskin, but a living golden boar that began to walk around the forge, sniffing at the air. Sindri clapped his hands and laughed, shouting delightedly, "Wonderful, marvelous, just what we wanted! Isn't he beautiful? The gods will love him, won't they? We'll call him Gullinbursty." That's a good name, isn't it? To make the second magical treasure, Sindri took a special oven and placed it in the hottest part of the forge and began spinning it round and round, singing, "Gold that melts, gold that spins, gold that forms eight golden rings, flows and glows and shines and wins. Do it now as Sindri sings." Brock, meanwhile, pumped on the bellows for all he was worth, knowing that the temperature had to be kept high at this crucial stage. But the vicious gadfly had returned and stung him right on the cheek. He shook his shaggy, oversized dwarf's head, but could not release his grip on the handle of the bellows to swat the evil insect, because the magic would be spoiled, and he had to grit his teeth as the wicked stinger. Dug into his face, and blood trickled down over his grey bearded chin. Eventually, just before the oven stopped spinning, the gadfly ceased tormenting Brock and flew away into the darkness of the cave. Sindri removed the special oven from the forge and took out a beautiful golden ring, 
which he named Draupnir, the gold dropper. For every nine days, eight more identical golden rings would drop from it. For the final treasure, Sindri brought iron to make a war hammer, dropping it into a special cast and telling Brock to keep the heat as high as possible. While the long-suffering Brock pumped away on the bellows, the gadfly, which was really the god of mischief, Loki, trying to sabotage the dwarf's efforts in order to keep his head on his shoulders, reappeared and this time stung the unfortunate Brock right in the eye. Determined and stubborn though Brock was, the pain was more than he could stand, and for a couple of vital seconds he dropped the handle of the bellows to swat away the tormenting insect. Sindri quickly ran to the forge and, taking a pair of large iron tongs, removed the war hammer, casting his expert eye over it as he tutted and shook his head and muttered, It looks like no harm was done except for the handle. It's shorter than it ought to be. No, but what's done is done. We were lucky there, brother. We could have had a disaster on our hands. As he finished speaking, Loki stepped out of the shadows, smirking, and said to Brock, Well, all finished, are we? My, my, Brock, that eye looks nasty. What happened? Did something sting you? I'd get that seen to if I were you. Fine, all right then, let's get going, shall we? It's a fair trot to Asgard. So, gathering up their treasures, Loki and the two dwarf brothers set off for Asgard to have their work judged by the gods. When they reached Asgard, all the gods assembled in the great hall of Valhalla to have a good look at what they brought. Loki offered his gifts first, handing over the spear Gungnir to Odin, the golden hair to Thor, and the enchanted ship Skidblade to Frey. The god seemed well pleased with what he had brought them, and he felt confident that he would keep his head. But then Brock began to hand over what he and his brother had made, explaining the secrets of each gift to each god in turn. He gave Odin the ring, Draupnir, which assured its owner of eternal wealth, and to Frey he gave the golden boar, Golinbasti, pointing out that it could transport a rider over earth, sea or sky by day or night faster than any normal steed, and moreover, by night, its golden glow would illuminate the way for its rider. The final gift was the short-handled hammer, which he presented to Thor, saying, O oh, great Thor, I give you a weapon worthy of the god of thunder, the hammer Molnir. Mjolnir cannot be broken and will shatter anything you choose to hit, and after it strikes its target, it will return flying to your hand. Uh, one last thing. It has such a short handle that you can carry it inside your shirt if you wish, should you ever need to conceal it. Loki was furious that the crafted dwarf had made a virtue out of the little defect he had caused in the enchanted weapon, and began to get nervous about what the god's decision might be. Finally, after much comparing and consulting, Odin announced his decision, declaring the hammer Mjolnir to be the most useful gift and the ideal weapon for Thor to use in his battles with the giants, and he confirmed that the dwarves had won the bet. Loki protested furiously, but to no avail, and then offered to pay a forfeit, but Brock was adamant that only the head of the trickster would satisfy the terms of the wager, and the god of mischief, panicked, grabbed a pair of winged sandals he kept handy for emergencies, and sped off, running over land and sea to escape his doom. But Thor, who was still angry with Loki and indebted to the dwarves for his new hammer, chased after him and caught him in a trice, bundling him into a net so that he would not be able to escape again, and then brought him back to face the grim-faced Brock and Sindri. As Brock took a huge sharp battle-axe and came towards Loki to chop his head off, Sindri made him kneel on the big wooden chopping block where the gods cut their firewood. In a last desperate attempt to save his neck, the screaming Loki invoked his blood oath with Odin and protested that since the wager had only referred to his head, the dwarves could only take it if they could do so without harming his neck, which was not part of the bet. 
even though the gods felt Loki's argument to be somewhat twisted, because of his oath of blood with Odin, they decided to back him up and insisted that if Brock wanted to take Loki's head, he must do so without hurting his neck. Brock and Sindri realized they were being cheated, but Brock, in particular, still smarting from the sting of the gadfly, was determined that if he could not have the mischievous one's head. He would at least still his wagging tongue before returning to Svartalfheim. Sindri gave him a long strand of leather like a bootlace and his magical needle, and Brock stitched the god of mischief's lips together, much to the amusement of the other gods, Thor in particular. It took Loki months to unpick the leather strand from the holes in his lips. And for a long time after that, he was unable to talk because his lips hurt so much, which kept everyone happy for as long as it lasted. Hall of the Giants. When Thor tangled with giants, he usually resolved the matter with a single mighty blow with his enchanted hammer, Mjolnir. But sometimes things got a bit more complicated. One such occasion was when Thor entered the very halls of the giants and came face to face with their king, Utgard Loki. Bored from being in the house and feeling in the need of some exercise, Thor left Asgard one sunny afternoon and headed for Jotunheim to do a spot of giant harrying, which was one of his favourite parts of the job of being the god of thunder. He took Loki with him because it was easier to keep an eye on the mischievous one than trying to untangle the pickles he got himself into from time to time. Besides, he was occasionally useful with his quick brain and cunning ways. As they left in Thor's chariot, drawn by his two mighty rams, it was quite late, and night was beginning to fall before they reached Jotunheim. It was getting both dark and cold, and landing in an isolated part of Midgard, they went to a small farmhouse to ask for hospitality for the night. Now times had been hard on Midgard, for winter still had the land in its icy grasp, and food was scarce. Realizing this, and partly because he had a generous nature, and partly because he liked to eat well, Thor sacrificed his two rams and cooked them so there was an abundant, hot, steaming, sweet-tasting meat for all at table that night. As they sat down to eat, he lay the pelts of the rams on the hearth, telling the farmer and his wife and their two children, a boy called Thiarfi and his younger sister Roskva, that when they had finished eating the meat, they must throw the bones onto the pelt. Then, giving thanks to Odin, they began to have their supper. Now the boy Thiarfi, who was a fine, strapping lad with a reputation for being a fast runner, could eat just as quickly, and he wolfed down his share of the meat. But then did something he should not have done. He cracked open one of the leg bones and sucked out the marrow, licking his lips in appreciation of the feast he had enjoyed in the company of Thor. Just why this was unwise became apparent the next morning. Eager to get an early start, Thor and Loki gathered up their belongings. Then the thunder god began to incant the runes over the remains of his two rams. In a flash of lightning, the magnificent beasts were whole again, and Thor led them out to the chariot to harness them. When he noticed that one was limping badly, realizing what must have happened, Thor was absolutely furious, and summoning the farmer and his family before him, demanded to know who was responsible. Now an angry Thor was a sight to behold. His great hands gripped Mjolnir so hard that his knuckles went white as the sky overhead turned black and thunder boomed. Looking into the red-bearded face of the god, the farmer could see his furrowed brow and his shaggy eyebrows meeting in the middle, and worst of all, lightning flashing in his eyes. 
the terrified mortals threw themselves to their knees, begging his forgiveness, and the farmer offered the angry god his children as servants. Not being a bully, and realizing it had been the youngster's mistake, Thor calmed down, relaxing his white-knuckled grip on Mjolnir. He decided to accept the farmer's offer, at least until his ram recovered, and borrowed the man's fishing boat to get to Jotunheim, telling him to take good care of the rams. So it turned out that by that time, Thor got on his way to Jotunheim again. He was at the head of a party of four, and once they had crossed the sea, they had to travel on foot in the land of the giants. Thor felt like exploring, and so took his party into an area of Jotunheim he had never visited before, a region called Utgard. By nightfall, they found themselves making their way through a dark forest of tall fir trees, and they had not come across any inns or farmhouses. Just when it seemed that they would be sleeping under their cloaks beneath the stars, they came across a strange building. This odd structure, which they could not make out very clearly in the darkness, had a cavernous entrance, but no door. And inside, there were five large doorless rooms, all the same width, but different lengths. The entrances to four of them were directly in front, with one slightly off to the side. The four weary travellers took a room each and settled down to sleep for the night. A few hours later, they were awakened by a tremendous roaring noise, and the earth shook as if an earthquake was in progress. The other three clung to Thor for protection as he tried to figure out what was happening. Eventually, the room stopped shaking, and they were able to go back to sleep. Just before dawn, it happened again. Thor went outside to see what was going on and discovered the biggest giant he had ever seen sleeping on the ground, only yards from where they had been spending the night. The giant was snoring loudly, and his snores were what had caused the earth to shake. As Thor stood looking at him, the giant's huge eyes suddenly opened, as big and white as the moon, and with a tremendous yawn, the enormous being sat up. Putting his great hands behind his head, and began to stretch his back. Thor challenged the giant to identify himself, and in a huge, booming voice which made the trees shake, he said, "I am Skrymir, and I don't need to ask who you are. I would know that red beard and hammer anywhere. You're the Asgardian Thor, the Thunder God, aren't you?" At the sound of the giant's voice, Loki and the two mortals appeared, and when they saw the giant, ran quickly to hide behind Thor. The giant continued speaking without waiting for Thor to answer. So you stole my glove, did you? Well, what a nerve! He reached past the four companions to pick up his glove, which turned out to be the building where they had spent the night. Skrymir tucked the glove into his belt and then offered to accompany the travellers on their journey through the wood, saying they would all be safer travelling together. Not wishing to endanger his companions by fighting with this huge giant, who seemed friendly enough, Thor agreed that they could travel together. The giant then untied his sack of provisions and began to prepare his breakfast. So Thor and his companions did the same. However, when they had finished breakfast. Skrymir said that they should put their supplies together, as that was how things were done in Jotunheim. He grabbed the god's food bag and dropped it into his own before anybody had a chance to disagree. They began walking. At least Skrymir walked. The others had to run to keep up, as his huge strides were so long. The giant seemed to be tireless and did not stop until it was nearly nightfall. His companions, except for Thor, were exhausted from trying to keep up with him, and were more than happy to collapse in a sweaty heap when he finally stopped. Skrymir sat down under an enormous oak tree, saying that he was not hungry and was going straight to sleep, and gave Thor the bag with the provisions in so that they could make supper. In a matter of minutes, the giant was snoring contentedly, while the thunder god, for his part, struggled to undo the knot in the huge bag. Try as he might, he could not undo it, nor could he tear it open. And as he got increasingly angry, he began to suspect sorcery. Finally, losing his temper, he threw the bag aside, grabbed his hammer, and threw it at the sleeping giant, fetching him a mighty blow to the forehead. 
As the enchanted hammer returned to Thor's hand, Skrymir opened one eye and brushed his hair across his brow, muttering, "Damned leaves! One can't get a decent nap anywhere these days." And shifted his position to make himself more comfortable. And seeing Thor standing there, hammer in hand, said, "Finished eating already? Have you?" If I were you, I'd get some sleep. There's a long way to go tomorrow. And with that, shut his eyes and began snoring again. There being nothing else they could do, Thor and his companions also lay down to try and get some rest. But between their grumbling, empty bellies and the giant's snores, it was virtually impossible. About midnight, Thor had had as much as he could stand, and jumping to his feet. Climbed up a massive oak tree until he was above the sleeping giant's head. Then he brought Mjolnir crashing down with all the force of his good right arm. The hammerhead sunk into the giant's skull, and Thor was sure that he had killed him. But Skrymir just moved in his sleep, mumbled something about acorns, and carried on snoring. Thor was dumbfounded. Thor had never met a giant that could withstand the power of his hammer before, and began to have serious doubts about his ability to hurt this strange creature. After giving the matter some serious thought, he decided he would have one more try. This time, using all his force, he crept up to the giant again, who was by now lying flat on his back, snoring noisily, and taking Mjolnir in both hands, began to swing it round and round, then slammed it into the giant's temple. Only a few inches of handle protruded from the great head, just enough for Thor to get a grip and pull the hammer out. He was surprised to note that there was no blood on the hammer, and then got a terrible shock when the giant's voice boomed out, "Ah, what was that? That felt like bird droppings. Don't say some dirty crow has done its business on me." Thor, what are you doing awake? Did you get sore too, or was it time to get up already? The giant's cavernous mouth opened menacingly as he gave a great yawn, and the four companions wondered if he would now try to eat them. But he just sat up and said, "Oh, we might as well get going. You know, you're, you're quite close to Utgard, the stronghold of King Utgard Loki." If you don't want to spend the whole day trekking through the forest after me, you could always go there.、Uh, but if you do, I must warn you: it is wise to show King Utgard Loki a lot of respect. His courtiers don't like pretentious people who get puffed up with a sense of their own importance and start acting big, especially when they're tiny, insignificant mites like yourselves. And really, you're so small and vulnerable. You shouldn't even be in Jotunheim. I mean, there are a lot of wild animals here that would gobble the four of you up in a single bite. You'd be better off going back where you came from, if you want my opinion. Anyway, I'm off. If you want to come with me, get ready now. And without another word, Skrymir picked up the sack with the provisions in it and marched off into the woods. Pleased to see the back of him, but not so happy to be without provisions, Thor decided to go and seek the fort of Utgard and request hospitality from its giant king. After spending the morning walking through the silent forest, which seemed deserted, they eventually came to a huge plain where the forest petered out. There it was. The fortress of Utgard Loki, king of the giants. It was the biggest building any of them had ever seen. Its towers were so high they disappeared into the clouds, and the main gate so wide that a thousand men walking arm in arm could have passed through. The battlements were decorated with the carved heads of wolves, lions, and bears, dragons with teeth and fangs as big as a tall man. The main gate was closed and barred, but there was a side gate, like a portcullis, where they were able to get in by squeezing between the iron bars, each one as thick as a tree trunk. Once inside the main courtyard, their attention was drawn to a central hall, from which the sound of eating, drinking, and singing reached their ears. Stomachs rumbling, they made their way across the colossal courtyard and walked into the hall of Utgard Loki. 
No sooner were they inside than a giant bigger than the rest hailed them. Oh, well, what have we here? Four lost little insects, or, or are they mice? But I am Utgard Loki, king of this place, and you, correct me if I'm wrong, you must be the Asgardian Thor of the two goats. Uh, no, no, perhaps I'm mistaken. The mighty Thor would have to be somewhat larger, wouldn't he? Perhaps this is some sort of joke. Anyway, whoever you are, Identify yourselves and tell me what you want. You aren't allowed to be here unless you can demonstrate some special skill or talent. So tell me, what can you and your friends do to justify being here? Now the god of mischief, Loki of Asgard, who had been having a miserable time on the strip since they had arrived in Jortenheim, was fed up with the way Thor had been doing things. And besides that, his stomach was completely empty. As a result, he stepped forward challengingly and said, Special abilities, I'll show you special abilities. I am Loki, and I can eat faster than anyone in this room. Who wants to take me on, eh? Or are you giants just big windbags after all? Utgard Loki answered him, smiling. Oh, I think we're more than that, Loki of Asgard. And I think we have someone who can test the truth of your claim among us. The giant king tapped on his table once, and a tall, thin-looking giant with a lean, hard aspect stepped forward. And Utgard Loki said, This is Loji. As you can see, he's a bit on the thin side, but you are so small it would be hardly fair to try you against one of our stronger eaters. Presently, a huge trough of food was prepared, containing whole roast boars and all manner of sausages and pies, and even a couple of cows, and Loki stood at one end facing Loji at the other, until the signal to begin eating was given. The ravenous Loki ripped through his food, scoffing great handfuls without pausing even for breath, and within a matter of minutes had reached the centre of the trough, leaving the bones behind him. But so too had Loji. And what is more, he had eaten the gravy and the bones and the wood of the trough too. Loki was flabbergasted and humiliated too, for no one had ever beaten him when it came to eating. His head hung down in shame, but at least his belly was full again. Then the boy Thiafi stepped forward and said, I'm the fastest runner in the parts I come from. Who wants to race against me? A youth stepped out from amongst the giants to answer his challenge, and they went outside to test one another. Utgard Loki said that to make it fair, they should run over three distances, one chosen by him and one by each competitor. The Arfi suggested two laps of the great courtyard, and off they went. In the time it took him to run one, the giant youth had done two, and sat combing his hair, waiting for him to finish. Utgard Loki then said they should run to the top of the steps that led to the central tower of the fortress. As the Arfi's foot touched the third step on the way up, the giant passed him coming down. He was so much faster. For the final race, which was a dash from the doorway of the great hall to the kitchen and back, the Arfi had barely lifted his foot to start to run, and the giant, in a flash almost too quick for the eye to see, ran there and back. Better stop now, young Thiafi. I mean, you're a fair runner, but you aren't going to win today, scoffed Utgard Loki. Now, Redbeard, what can you do? He said, addressing Thor. What can I do? said the Thunder God. I can drink any giant here under the table for a start. With that, a huge drinking horn was brought, and Utgard Loki explained that to be considered a mighty drinker amongst the giants, it was necessary to empty the horn in a single draught. Two goes was considered acceptable drinking, but any oaf could do it in three. Now Thor had a powerful thirst, and without further ado, he took a deep breath, lifted the great horn to his lips, and began to pour the cold, salty-tasting liquid down his throat. He swallowed and swallowed and swallowed until he thought his lungs must burst. Then he lowered the horn. The level of liquid in it had hardly gone down at all, and the puzzled thunder god shook his head. Never mind, Thor, try again. 
I'm sure you'll do it this time, said Utgard Loki mockingly. Angrily, Thor tipped the horn into his mouth and drank deeply for as long as his lungs would let him. When he lowered the horn, it was perhaps a fraction lower, but only a fraction. Taking another deep breath, he raised it a third time without speaking and tried his best to drain the horn dry. Yet when he lowered it again, it was just as it had been before, which puzzled him mightily. Well, it doesn't look as if you qualify as a big drinker by our standards, Thorn. Is there anything else you, you think you're good at? smirked Utgard Loki with a bored expression on his face. The red-faced Thor, suspecting that somehow he had been tricked, retorted, I don't know what's going on here, but if this had been in Asgard, that horn would be empty by now, and I, I must say I, I don't think much of your salty giant's beer. There's something funny going on here, but I'll accept any challenge you care to make me. And he threw the great horn into the corner of the room where it fell with a mighty clank. Utgard Loki smiled and said, Well, Thor, I have to admit you've been a big disappointment so far. I've heard so much about you, I was expecting a lot more. But anyway, let's see. Ah, oh, yes, I have just the thing. A game that children here play when they're bored. Let's see if you can lift up my old cat. The rest of the giants in the hall began to go four and fell about laughing at the challenge. By now, Thor was boiling with anger and went to try his arm with the cat. Now, being a giant's cat, it was about as big as a large horse, but still should not have posed a problem for Thor. He walked over, put his arms around its waist, and lifted. The cat's back arched, but all four feet remained firmly planted on the ground. Twice he tried to lift the cat off the ground, and twice all he succeeded in doing was make it arch its back. At the third attempt, he got down on his hunkers underneath it and stood up, lifting his arms high above his head. But all he managed to do was lift one of the cat's paws clear of the ground. His ears ringing with the giant's laughter and his face burning with indignation, Thor snarled at the assembled onlookers. Bah! This is farce! Enough of it! Who among you is man enough to wrestle with me hand to hand, eh? Come on, I'll fight anyone here. I don't care how big he is. Let's see who is the better wrestler. Utgard Loki replied, Well, Thor, I don't think any of the giants wants to suffer the indignity of wrestling with someone whose strength is just sufficient to lift one of my cat's paws off the ground. However, there is an old crone called Ellie, who I've seen tumble many a stronger man than you appear to be. You can wrestle with her if you like. Once again, the sound of giant laughter filled Thor's ears, making him fit to boil over. Had it not been for Odin's laws of hospitality, he would have pulled out Mjolnir there and then and began smiting giants. As it was, he had to content himself with the old crone who hobbled out to face him. Her face was haggard and wrinkled, and her back was bent. When she walked towards Thor, she looked as if she were shuffling on arthritic feet. Utgard Loki had to shout to her that Thor wanted to try his arm against her, for she seemed to be deaf too. Feeling slightly stupid, but also quite sure that things were not what they seemed, Thor took a grip of the old crone and pulled her towards him, or at least he tried to. To his surprise, he could not move her. Then, when she gripped him, she had a grip of iron, which he struggled unsuccessfully to break. Thor fought and struggled, using every wrestling trick he knew, and every ounce of power that he had in his muscles. But it was useless. Ellie just kept her grip on his wrist and shoulder, and slowly, inexorably, forced him down onto one knee. As soon as his knee touched the floor, Utgard Loki cried, Enough! Well done, old one. I think you have taught this arrogant little god a lesson. You can go back to bed now. Then he turned to Thor and his companions and said, After what I've seen today, you are welcome to stay for tonight, but no longer. 
Now, come and have food and drink. You must be tired after your exertions. And his great, hearty laughter boomed around the hall and was taken up by all the giants assembled there. Thor and his companions, in subdued mood, sat and ate and drank their fill before retiring for the night. The next morning, Utgard Loki walked with Thor and the others, accompanying them until they were outside the fortress gates, and as they walked towards the woods, he said to the glum faced god, Well, Thor, how did you enjoy your little stay with us? You'll have plenty to tell them when you get back to Asgard, won't you? Thor replied sourly, I, I think the less said about this little expedition, the better. I, I really do not understand what has happened to me in the last couple of days. Utgard Loki began to chuckle in that irritating way of his and smiled at Thor, saying, Ah,、oh, mighty one, do not be too downhearted, for here in Utgard things are not always what they seem. As well as being king of the giants, I am their mightiest enchanter. And since you have been here, you have been in my power. Do you remember the giant Skrimir that you met in the forest? That was me. When you thought your hammer blows had no effect, that was because I used the magic to redirect the force. Look what you did to that chain of mountains. And he lifted Thor in his hand, pointing to a line of mountains split by three great valleys, each one larger than the next. Then he put him back down and went on. Had I known your power before you came here, I would never have let you into my fortress. The tests you and your companions undertook were impossible to win. Never in my life have I seen a living being eat as fast as Loki, but Loki was fire. Which, as you know, has the greediest of appetites and consumes everything before it, once it gets started. As for Thiafi, the boy runs like the wind, but his opponent was thought itself, and there is nothing as fast as the speed of thought. And as for you, Thor, well, you have been a revelation. The horn you drank from was filled by the mighty ocean, and though it didn't seem to go down in the horn, the tide outside dropped by thirty feet at your last draft. As for my cat, well, you were only trying to lift the Midgard serpent, Hormunganda, and when you lifted him from his place on the sea floor, when you got the paw off the ground, There was not a giant in the hall whose heart was not in his mouth. We thought for a second that you were going to pull his tail out of his mouth and that you would destroy the world. You are so strong. And as for the crone, Ellie, she is old age, mother time, who overcomes all men and gods sooner or later. No one ever resisted her power for as long as you did. It was awesome to behold. Thor was stunned and not sure whether to be pleased or angry for a second, and snorted. Ha! Magic! I knew there was something funny going on. Then Utgard Loki continued. Now you must leave and never come back, for I have other more powerful enchantments with which to defend my land. But I would rather we never met again, for you would be a truly terrible enemy, mighty Thor. And with that, he and his enchanted fortress and all the giants vanished into thin air, which was just as well, really, because Thor had taken out Mjolnir as Utgard Loki had been speaking and had been considering taking his revenge for the trickery and humiliation that he had had to endure. So they set off for home the same way they had come, and Thor, for one, had plenty of food for thought on the journey home.
the death of Baldur. Time passed in Asgard, and the gods enjoyed their lives, for their home was truly a paradise. But every paradise has its dark force, and in Asgard, this was Loki. Although handsome and charming, with a dazzling smile and a razor-sharp wit, Loki was a great disappointment to Odin and the gods. He could be entertaining and fun to be with, and he should have been happy in Asgard. But his blood was tainted. There was a shadow in his soul and a blackness in his heart. He was like an incorrigible child, committing one act of mischief after another, each one a little bit more serious. Because he was a quick-witted individual, he could usually talk his way out of any problems he created for himself, or shift the blame onto others. But eventually, everyone came to realize his real nature, that he was never going to change for the better. The gods underestimated his capacity for malice and evil. Even Odin failed to see just how bad he could be. Just as great oaks grow out of tiny acorns, so out of relatively trivial acts of mischief, a great evil grew. It was Loki's nature to feel unhappy and despondent when others felt well, and only in doing evil could he find real pleasure. Loki was a malcontent, and the more he saw good around him, the more he wanted to do evil. His discomfort only ceased when he caused other people to suffer, and if it had not been for Thor helping to keep him out of trouble, things would have taken a turn for the worse much sooner. Loki was anything but grateful, though, and grew to hate the Thunder God and all the other gods of Asgard, too. The fear of Thor's great strength and furious temper kept him in check. He had learned not to provoke the Thunder God when he had stolen Sif's hair, and being crafty was careful not to make the same mistake twice. There was another god, though, who became the focus for Loki's hatred, and that was Odin's other son, Baldur the Beautiful. Baldur was the best-loved and most popular person in Asgard. With the exception of Loki, everyone loved him. He was handsome, strong, wise, gentle, and above all, noble. His was the purest spirit in Asgard, and the gods loved him for it. There was also a prophecy that while Baldur lived... Ragnarok could not come to pass, so his presence made everyone feel safe and secure. Now, one of the outstanding things about Baldur was that he was invulnerable. Nothing could harm him, or at least almost nothing. In the distant past, Baldur had had a dream that his life was in danger, and Odin, realizing the significance of this, had gathered a council of all the gods to discuss what could be done to safeguard his life. After much deliberation, Frigg declared that, as she was the mother of all things on and in the earth, she would extract promises from all her children that they would never harm Baldur. The poisonous snake swore, the wild animals swore, and even the poisons and carriers of disease and illness swore, and all the rocks, fire, water, metals and stones promised that they would never harm Baldur. A consequence of this was that Baldur in his entire life never suffered injury or pain of any kind. He never cut himself, he never tripped up or fell down, and he was to all intents and purposes invulnerable. When his friends and brothers realized this, they developed a sport which involved using him for target practice, knowing that their weapons would merely bounce off him, leaving him unharmed. The gods delighted in displaying their prowess with weapons and Baldur's invulnerability into the bargain, and startled visitors by throwing spears, knives, axes, and even firing flaming arrows at him. It was all to no avail, for no weapon could harm him. Even Thor's hammer, Mjolnir, just bounced off without doing any damage. All this time, Loki, who was more unpopular with every day that passed, because of his troublemaking and malice, watched Baldur with growing envy, and in time he grew to hate him even more than he hated Thor. It became his most heartfelt desire to do Baldur some serious hurt, if possible even kill the god whom all believed to be invulnerable. This twisted craving took up much of the evil one's time, and one day, by using dark sorcery, he discovered that in all of creation there was one thing that had not sworn to not harm Baldur, and could be used to kill him. 
mistletoe, which Frigg had overlooked because it was still only a growing sprig when the promises were made. Once he learned this fact, Loki began to hatch a dark plan to kill Baldur while avoiding getting blamed for the deed himself. One day, as he watched the gods at sport, with Baldur testing his invulnerability to swords and spears, he noticed blind Hodor sitting apart from the game, unable to take part because of his disability, and he had an idea. That night at home, he took the mistletoe and he sharpened it into a point and fixed it to the end of a spear shaft. The following morn, the deadly weapon made, he went to find Baldur, who was in his usual place where a group of children were throwing stones at him and laughing. Smiling to himself, he then walked over to where Hodor sat and said to him, whispering to disguise his voice, Hodor, why don't you join in the game and have some fun? Don't you want to throw something at Baldur and hear the children's laughter when it bounces off him? The blind god replied, Ah. Uh, the blind god replied, Ah, uh, I wish I could. But the other gods don't like me to handle weapons in case I accidentally injure someone. I'd better not. Someone might get hurt. The crafty Loki knew exactly what to say, though, and chuckled at his own cleverness. Nonsense. Why, I myself shall guide your hand. There'll be no danger to anyone, and you'll be doing bound to a great honour by letting him display his invulnerability. The enemies of Asgard will tremble when they hear of it. Everyone will applaud you when the spear bounces off him. Come on, you'll enjoy it, I promise you. Now Hodor had long felt left out of many games and sports because of his blindness, and not realising that he was talking with Loki, suspected nothing and was easily persuaded. Loki took him to within a dozen paces of Baldur and called to the Shining One. Oh, Baldur, look over here. Hodor would test your metal against his spear arm. As Baldur turned, smiling to the sound of the voice and the sound of his friend, Hodor's name, Loki drew back the blind god's arm and hissed, Now, blind one, throw with all your might. Show them what you can do. And Hodor cast the fatal spear, unerringly guided by the eyes and hand of Loki. The mistletoe point drove straight into Baldur's unprotected chest, and for the first and only time in his long existence, he felt the terrible stab of pain. Letting out a long and terrible moan, he dropped to the ground dead, his heart pierced by Loki's evil. At first, the children thought Baldur was play-acting, but then, when they realised he was truly dead, there was great shouting and confusion, during which the wily Loki slipped away. Hodur was heartbroken when he discovered what had happened. The other gods, Odin, Heimdall and Thor in particular, were furious. Heimdall had seen Loki making the spear point out of mistletoe, but had not known of Baldur's one weakness. Odin realised what had happened, and knew that the door to Ragnarok had been opened. They buried Baldur nine days later, with all the honour due to a prince of the gods, putting him in a great dragon ship which they set afire and cast adrift upon a sea of the colour of blood as the sun set on Asgard. The ship sailed into the setting sun and drifted off to hell. As it did so, Odin said to Hermod the Quick, the fastest of the gods, Take my charger, Sleipnir, and go to dread Hela, the queen of hell. Beseech her to release the soul of Baldur, for if she does not, Ragnarok will come for her, as surely as for all of us. Hermod raced to hell on Odin's steed and entered the dread realm of the dead, and deep within its inner circle he found the shade of his dead brother enthroned there as a king. He went to Hela and begged her to release Baldur's soul. The Queen of Hell looked at Hermod and said, I will release your brother on one condition, and that is that every living thing in the world above weep for him. If just one being refuses to shed a tear for Baldur, he stays here, and may Ragnarok consume us all. 
Hermod raced back to Asgard with the news, and the word was spread, and all of creation wept for the loss of Baldur. Even the rocks and trees shed salt tears for his return. But one there was who did not weep, an old crone who declared herself to be dry eyes, but who was really Loki in disguise and hiding from the gods. When asked to shed a tear for Baldur, she said, "What's hell's hell? Let him rot there. I never liked him anyway." And so Baldur remained in hell. After the passing of Baldur, the gods changed, for they knew that the summer of their existence had died with him. Now they had the autumn to contend with, and all too soon would arrive the winter of Ragnarok. The laughter ceased, and crying and wailing were heard for the first time in Asgard, and the faces of the gods became grim and set, and fearful to look upon. The morning done, Odin assembled the gods, and said, "The time of happiness is over. Loki has doomed us all. We must find the evil one and punish him for this vilest of deeds." Thor and Heimdall and the other gods sought him out, and although he tried to escape by turning into a salmon and hiding in a river, they took nets to fish him out. He tried swimming away, but the vengeful Thor caught him by the tail and plucked him out of the water. Now you shall die, scaly one! He thundered as he held the wriggling salmon Loki in his grasp. Loki, unable to breathe the air, turned back into his normal self, and Thor. Who held him by the ankles plunged him into the river, and would have drowned him then and there for his crimes, had not the other gods reminded him of Odin's orders. Loki was taken back to Asgard, where he was condemned to an eternal punishment. Odin did not want to execute him, for once dead, he would automatically fulfill the prophecy of Ragnarok and take his place at the helm of the ship of death. Loki was taken to the underworld and chained to a rock. Where a poisonous serpent was hung over his head, so that its burning venom would drip into his eyes and torment him until the end of time. In fact, after eons of pain, he broke free of his chains, in time to play a leading role in Ragnarok, as the Norns had prophesied. <laughs> Ragnarok, the twilight of the gods. The coming of Ragnarok, the twilight of the gods, is predestined and cannot be helped. It is a time feared by both gods and men. And shall be noted first in the world of men by three years of continuous, widespread warfare, of bloody and unnatural acts, with brother turned against brother and father against son. It will be a sword time, a raven time, a time when the wolves grow fat on the corpses of the slain. Immediately after the three years' war, a terrible winter will come, known as Finbol. And it will be like three winters, one after another, with no spring, summer, or autumn in between. The rivers will turn into ice, and the ice will be as hard and cold as iron. And freezing winds will blow from all four points of the compass at once, chilling the bones. And those not killed by the war will freeze or starve. Then the last few men shall see a truly terrible thing. For the great wolf shall swallow the sun, and its brother shall gobble up the moon, and all the stars shall fall from the heaven. The earth shall shake and heave, and mountains and rocks shall be split asunder, and the dwarves and elves will wail for pity. But nothing can be done to stop this terrible catastrophe from running its course. As the earth buckles and heaves, 
Egypt, the great wolf Fenrir will break free of its bonds, and the Midgard serpent will free its tail from its mouth and begin to thrash and writhe, sending floods and tidal waves that shall add to the chaos and destruction. At this point, their evil father, the great enemy of the gods and humanity, dreaded Loki, will also break free of his chains and board the great ship of the dead, Nalfar, with its crew of murderers and all the evil dead. The anchor will be weighed, and its thousand oars will dip into the Black Sea, and it will set course for the shores of Asgard. The captain of the ship of death will be Loki, and he will bring Ragnarok to the gods as his dread offspring lay waste to Midgard. Fenrir shall run before him, its great jaws gaping wide over the land, spewing forth flame and destruction from moor and nostrils, setting fire to the earth and the sky. His brother, Jormunganda, blows out great billows of poisonous smoke and corruption, darkening the earth and tainting all with his vileness. Then the sky bursts open and the fire giants burst forth from Muspelheim, led by Surt astride his flaming charger. The heat and light is more intense than a thousand suns as the oldest of the giants swings his great fire sword, which has taken him all of existence to forge. The numberless hosts of Muspelheim ride roughshod over shimmering Bifrost, the rainbow bridge, shaking it and shattering it into a billion pieces as they pass into the great plain of Vigrid for the final battle. The field of battle will extend a hundred leagues from its center in each direction, but it will be filled from end to end by the fire, storm, ice, and mountain giants, and the evil dead, and Fenrir, Garm, and the Midgard serpent shall arrive to add their strength to the cohorts of evil. The gods will not be taken by surprise, however, for on the morning of Ragnarok, Heimdall will see and hear all that leads up to the final battle, and he shall set the great Jalahorn to his lips and blow, calling all the champions of good in the nine worlds to arms. The Valkyries and the Iron Ironheriar, the champions of Valhalla, shall surge forth from the great hall as Odin mounts his steed, Sleipnir, his great war spear, Gungnir, in his right hand, he flies to consult the head of Mimir one last time in a final desperate effort to ward off Ragnarok. Odin shall consult the well, but it is to no avail, for Mimir will not answer him, and he must return to Asgard to lead his warriors into the final battle. Odin takes the center of the field and leads his berserkers, Valkyries and the master ranks of the Iron Herrier and seeks out his mortal enemy, the wolf Fenrir. Thor, on his right flank in his chariot, attacks the master ranks of the storm giants, knowing that his destiny is to face Jormungandr, the Midgard serpent. As the mighty hosts clash, the slaying and the dying begin. Odin is one of the first to die. The one-eyed god, laughing at death, charges the monstrous Fenrir and hurls the enchanted spear, Gungnir, into the gaping jaws of the giant wolf. Fenrir swallows the spear, and Odin's fearless charge carries him into its great fanged maw. The father of the gods and his enchanted steed, Sleipnir, die instantly, consumed in a single huge bite, and the wolf begins to lay waste the massed ranks of the Iron Herrier. Thor, who is occupied fighting with the ice and mountain giants, sees his father die, and his rage is beyond human description. Howling in his anger and grief, the thunder rolls and the lightning flashes, and he takes the battle to the giants. Giant after giant falls before the hammer Mjolnir, as the battle lust consumes the red-bearded god. His hammer blasts through shields, splits helmets, smashes bones, and crushes armor until he comes face to face with Hormungandr, his nemesis, the dreaded Midgard serpent. The serpent's mighty coils crush men and horses and armor as it wreaks havoc among the forces of Asgard. Deadly venom drips from its cavernous maw, and thousands die screaming and in terror before its terrifying onslaught. Thor 
is ready to die, as he has always lived, without tasting fear. Knowing that his hour is at hand, the thunder god begins to sing his death song, a roaring, mournful dirge, as he swings Mjolnir two-handed above his head. He swings the hammer so fast it begins to glow and hum, its head crackling with energy. The serpent rears up, fold upon fold, towering above the god, and opens its great jaws to consume him. With a mighty roar of defiance, Thor leaps at the monster as thunder crashes and lightning rips the skies. He brings the hammer down with a deafening boom on the serpent's skull, and Jormungandr's head literally explodes, splashing the battling warriors around it with its deadly venom. It drops to the floor dead with a crash that shakes the heavens. The thunder god, his great task done, his fatal nemesis destroyed, and all his energy spent, steps back from the fallen monster, and takes nine steps before collapsing dead himself, poisoned by its terrible venom. Following the deaths of Odin and Thor, the silent god, Vidar, wearing the great boot, battles his way through the massed ranks of the evil dead, and comes up against Fenrir, the slayer of Odin. Unspeaking, he leaps on the wolf's back, and locking his legs and arms around its neck, wrestles it to the ground. He grabs the monster's upper jaw with two hands, and stamps on its lower jaw with a magical boot. Then the boot begins to grow, and the grim-faced god rips the monster's jaws apart, splitting it in two as it howls and screams hideously. Thus is Odin avenged. Vidar carries on battling with the hosts of evil, stamping enemy after enemy into oblivion, until he comes face to face with the oldest monster, Dread Sirt, who burns him and the boot into a pile of charred cinders. Tyre, the war god, is in his element and slays uncountable numbers of the enemy, then finds himself facing Garm, the great hound of hell, he charges the great dog, grinning in anticipation, and is swallowed whole by the monstrous beast. However, as he passes through its stomach, he stabs and slashes it from the inside, so that it collapses and dies too. Loki finds himself hunted down by the relentless Heimdall. Though he tries to avoid the implacable god in the chaos and confusion of battle, there is no escape from destiny for the mischievous one. In their final clash there is no quarter asked or given, and both are consumed in lightning and fire till only ashes remain to mark their passing. The last of the Asgardian generals to fall is Frey, who finds himself opposing the fire giant Surt. But Frey has no defense against the flaming titan's power. For eons before, he had surrendered the great sword that could fight by itself to the giants in return for the love of Gerda. And at Ragnarok, he pays for that love with his life and the death of the universe. The fire giant kills the last of the gods and then sets fire to everything. All is consumed in roaring flames and in the end, there is only smoke and dust and black ashes to mark the passing of the gods. This is the way the world will end. <laughs>